Okay, folks, let's get started. Somebody have an announcement for today? I thought I got an email saying that somebody wanted to make an announcement. I guess not, but no. Um, So I want to pick up where I left off on Monday. We were talking about the optimal financing mix for a bank. Basically, which makes no sense, because when banks talk about capital, it's almost always in terms of equity capital. So when a bank says, we don't have enough capital, they're not talking about going out and borrowing money. They're talking about going out and raising equity capital. So that's why so much rode on that regulatory capital ratio that we saw, which was what, 7%, 8% in the previous example? And I think if you step back and look at those regulatory capital ratios, some of it is driven by what the regulatory authorities say, the Basel Accord, whatever it is. But some of it is self-imposed, right? I mean, were there banks before there were regulatory capital authorities? I mean, if you trace back regulatory capital requirements, they go back to the Great Depression. Prior to the Great Depression, banks were not regulated. So how did banks decide how much regulatory? Because in a sense, banks in the 1400s, or 1500s, or 1600s also needed capital to survive, right? So how did they decide how much capital to hold then before they had regulatory authorities tell them how much to hold? Well, what is the, the minimum is zero. You can say, well, look, I don't have to hold anything. What would happen to you as a bank if you did that? You'd go bankrupt. So banks maintained regulatory capital well before there were regulatory capital authorities. And how much they held depend on how risky their loans were, right? That's what it boiled down to. If your loans were guaranteed, you could end up with a very low regulatory capital. But if your loans were risky, so the Rothschilds, as they built up the great banking empire, the, lent money, but then they held regulatory capital, not because somebody told them they had to, but because it was a prudent thing to do. They wanted to survive and profit as well. You know what I'm trying to say? It's too many banks. If you look at how they decide to raise capital, look outwards. They look at what, what are the regulatory authorities telling us? What can we get away doing? They think of it almost like a game. If we can fool the regulatory authorities and hold less capital, and yay, we've, we've won. But you haven't won the game. The game is for you to survive. So the only consolation price you might have is the day you went bankrupt, you still met regulatory capital requirements. So if you're a good bank, you have to start with the regulatory capital requirements. Obviously, you've got to meet them. But you also have to ask yourself, what is the capital we need to set aside given the riskiness of the businesses we're in? Which might be well above the regulatory requirement. If it's well below, then you have a problem. But if it's well above, you know what you should do? You should probably take the regulatory capital requirements as a base and build up on it. So I'll give you an example. We looked at that hypothetical bank in the last session, which all it did was make loans and make money off the spread. So I looked at Deutsche Bank. In October of 2008, if you looked at its tier one capital ratio, and if you're not familiar with tier one, tier two, these are little games that regulatory authorities play. They count some things as capital. So for instance, preferred equity. Is it counted as capital? It depends on which tier of capital you're looking at. So basically, tier one, tier two, et cetera, reflect different regulatory definitions. Tier one is the broadest definition. Their tier one regulatory capital ratio is 10%, well above the minimum requirement of 6%. But Deutsche was also very clear, even after they lost money in 2008, that they did not want to go down to the regulatory minimum. In fact, because of 2008, it reinforced their belief that they needed to be above the regulatory capital ratio, maintain a buffer. Because they saw what happened to banks like Bank of America and Citi that, that were very close. The Bank of America and Citi were above the regulatory capital in 2008, but barely above. So all they were one big loss away from falling below. And Deutsche said, we don't want that. So their 10% regulatory capital ratio was, in fact, where they wanted to be. So you know what that means? They don't have to do anything special this year. They can, they can take the retained earnings, pay it out as dividends if they want to. They're going to be OK. Let's look, at, let's look at two other scenarios. Let's suppose they looked at the 10% and said, it's not enough. We need to go to 12% now after this crisis. 
that would mean they'd have to go out and issue fresh equity, cut back on dividends. If, on the other hand, they said 10% is too much, we can get down to 8%, they can pay huge dividends, buy back stock. Everything is driven by where you are in terms of your regulatory capital ratio and where you'd like to be. So when you get to banks and insurance companies, don't go looking for trouble. Don't try to compute the optimal cost of capital. Don't try to do debt ratios, because <laughs> defining debt, coming up with capital, doesn't really make sense for these institutions. So now let's talk about why different companies might have different optimal debt ratios. How many of you have actually tried the capital structure spreadsheet on your company? Oh, come on. One po at least one po what, what com I hate to pick on the one person who actually did what I asked them to do. What, <laughs> what company are you doing? Pinnacle Entertainment. What do you get as your optimal? Okay. Good. At least you got started, right? Hey. So at some point in time, anybody else do their optimal? Who are you doing? Win. Win. And what do you get as the optimal? 50% debt. Right? Well above the Disney optimal. Anybody else do an optimal? Who do you do, Katerina? Abbott Labs. Abbott Labs, and what do you get as the optimal? 30%. So you've got 50, 30. Any zeros? Anybody try an optimal and come up with zeros? No? 10%? No. But I'll guarantee you, once you've tried the numbers, some of you are going to end up with really low optimals, maybe 0%. And some are going to end up with, like, you know, like when, 50, 60, 70 percent optimal. So I want to talk about it. In fact, I'm going to write out that section of the project report for you. Because when, when you get to this section, you come up with the optimals. I'm not just looking for the number. Anybody can do it. You just have to plug the numbers into the spreadsheet. I'm looking to see what you're going to tell me about the optimal, why the optimals are different across companies. So get ready. This is the section right after the numbers in your project. Why does one company in my spreadsheet, in, my, in our project, have 70? Why does one company have zero? First factor driving differences in optimums is your marginal tax rate. It's one of the inputs in the spreadsheet. But more than that, what, why does the marginal tax rate matter? Why does it affect your optimal debt ratio? What's the trade-off here? Debt versus equity, right? What's the biggest benefit of debt? It's a tax benefit. The higher your marginal tax rate, the greater the tax benefit to debt. So if you have a 50% tax rate, I would expect to see a much higher optimal debt ratio than if you have a 20% tax rate. So here's what I did. I took my four companies for which I'd computed the optimal, and I looked at what the optimal debt ratio for these companies would be if I held everything else constant and changed just the tax rate. That's the nice thing about in the spreadsheet is you can keep everything else constant, change one variable at a time. Let's look at the strongest conclusion. At a 0% tax rate, you see what the optimal for every company is? Zero percent. I'm going to make a categorical statement, and I'll stand behind it. If you have a zero tax rate, I don't care what company you are, you could be the safest company in the face of the earth, it doesn't make any sense for you to borrow money. But you're saying, but cost of debt is lower than the cost of equity. I don't care. Because even though the cost of debt is lower than the cost of equity, all you're doing is shuffling chairs on the Titanic when you move around money from debt to equity. So if you have a zero tax rate, there is no tax benefit to debt. And if there's no tax benefit, think of the trade-off. Tax benefits versus bankruptcy costs, right? If you have zero tax benefits, even if you have tiny expected bankruptcy costs, why would you borrow money? So if you're Carnival Cruise Lines, and, you base it, and your tax rate is 2% or 1% or 0%, your optimal should be 0%. Now, you might actually choose to borrow money, but companies choose to do stupid things. Or they might be constrained in how much they can raise in financing from equity. In much of the Middle East, I, I mentioned, the corporate tax rate is zero. If you plug a zero tax rate, the optimal debt ratio you get is zero. But if you look at many Middle Eastern companies, they do choose to borrow money. You think, how can they get away with it? Two things. A lot of Middle Eastern companies, when they borrow money, get an implicit guarantee from the government. In other words, the government basically backs up their loans implicitly, saying, this is the problem with the Dubai ports or whatever that, you know, that fiasco was, where the government says, you can borrow money, and you know what? We'll whisper it among ourselves, but we'll back you up if things go bad. So you expected bankruptcy costs are shrunk. The other is, what's your alternative to borrowing money? If you wanted to grow, what are the two ways you can grow? You can borrow money and grow or issue equity, right? To issue equity, you need a vibrant equity capital market. 
And if there's one thing missing in much of the Middle East, it's a vibrant equity capital market. So if I cut you off at the pass and say, you're a public company, but you really are going to have a tough time raising equity because the capital markets are not liquid, they're not vibrant, then guess what? I'm forcing you to borrow money, not because it's the right thing for you to do even, but because I've cut off the other choice. But if you hold everything else constant, this is exactly what you'd expect to see. If any of you are doing airlines, and in your, in your sector you've got Ryanair, and you've got United, and you've got Southwest, don't be surprised to see Ryanair come in with a very low optimal, maybe even an optimal debt ratio of 0%. Why? Because the marginal tax rate in Ireland is only 12%. So that's the first factor. What's your tax rate? Any questions on the tax rate issue? Okay. Second, this is all about having earnings and cash flows to service your debt. The more you can generate as earnings and cash flows relative to your value as a firm, and in a minute I'm going to explain what I mean by relative to the values of firm, the more you can afford to borrow as a company. Okay? Let's take Disney. Disney had 6,829 million in 2008, or the trailing 12 months that I used. Its market value as a firm was about 61,875 million. So as a percentage of the market value, 68.29 divided by 61.875 gives you about 11%. They have cash flows that amount to 11% of their overall value. You think, who cares? What do I state the debt ratio as? As a percentage of your value as a firm, 20% debt ratio, 30% debt ratio, 50% debt ratio. The more cash flows you can generate as a company, the more debt you can service. So I'm going to look at how much you have as cash flow. I'm even going to go climb, climb the income statement. Take, look at your earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, the EBITDA, the cash flow. And I'm going to divide it by the total value of the firm and say, the higher that number, the more you can afford to borrow. What am I doing? I'm dividing EBITDA by the market value of the firm, right? If I flip that over, what, what, do I, what's, what, what am I going to end up close to? What's the multiple that you see all the time used by analysts? EBITDA divided by firm value flipped over becomes come on, the algebra. Firm value divided by EBITDA. I think, what the is he going with this? And if I subtract out cash from firm value, I have enterprise value to EBITDA. So what? You know, one of the rules of thumb that LBO participants use, because LBO participants borrow a ton of money, is they will do LBOs only if the EV to EBITDA is less than five. Which is another way of saying, if your EBITDA is 20% of your cash flows, I'm much more comfortable borrowing money. Why? Because I can take the cash and service the debt. This isn't rocket science. If you don't have the cash flows, you can't borrow money. So can Apple borrow a lot of money? I mean, we know it has a large cash button, but how much did Apple make as operating income last year? I think about 20-something billion, 24 billion. That's a lot of money, right? But as a percentage of their market value, as a percentage of their market value, 24 billion divided by 600 billion is only, only 4%. So you know what's going to happen when I plug those numbers into the optimal capital structure spreadsheet? It is true, Apple can borrow a lot of money in dollar terms. Maybe 50 billion, maybe 80 billion. Let's take the outer end of that, that estimate, 80 billion. You know what that works out to as a debt ratio? 80 billion divided by 600 still gives me only 15%. So if you have a growth company with a high market value relative to cash flows, don't be surprised that when you plug the numbers into your optimal capital structure, you come up with a low optimal debt ratio. This is the key number for those of you getting really high optimal debt ratio, 60, 70, 80%. This is the number that's going to explain it. You have a lot of cash flows being generated as a percentage of your market value as a company. So what's your tax rate? How much do you generate as cash flows? Any questions? Okay. Just to give you a sense of evolution of companies. When I first, I, I, I think I did my first optimal capital structure spreadsheet for Microsoft 15 years ago. I came up with an optimal of close to 0%. It was between 0 and 10. And I did it again about 10 years ago. It had climbed to about 10 to 20. Today, if you take Microsoft's numbers and you plug them in, you come up with an optimal debt ratio of 40 to 50%. What's changed? 
Does Microsoft make less money now than it did 15 years ago? No, it actually makes a lot more. But you know what's changed? The market value of the company is actually, as a, so if you look at how much they make as cash flows relative to the market value, that number has risen. It's like, it's basically capturing it in the life cycle. So the company can borrow a higher percentage of its market value today because the market value has dropped relative to the cash flow. It's become a mature company. At least the market is pricing it as if it's a mature company and your capital structure spreadsheet will reflect it. So what's your tax rate? How much do you generate in cash flows? Third and obvious factor is the riskier you are as a company, the lower your optimal should be. But let's think of the inputs in your capital structure spreadsheet that were, that were affected by risk. The first is the beta, right? Start with an unlevered beta. So if you were in a risky business, you had a higher unlevered beta. The second, of course, was the rating and the cost of debt. Now, we used to look up table for that. But if you were actually looking across companies and you're a risky company for a given interest coverage ratio, I would expect you to have a lower rating. So your interest coverage ratio might be six and mine might be six. But if I'm a regulated utility, an interest coverage ratio of six might give me a double A rating. But if you're a technology company, an interest coverage ratio of six might give you a triple B rating, which translates into higher cost of debt and less debt borrowed. So how risky are you? So what's your tax rate? How much do you generate in cash flows? How risky are you as a company? And here's the final fact, and this is the only macroeconomic factor to bring into play. There are two, th two ways of raising money, right? There's equity and there's debt. There are two markets. There's an equity market and a debt market. In each market, there's a price for risk. In the equity market, the overall price for risk is the equity risk premium. So we captured that over time. Remember how it w you know, went down from 1978 through 99, got down as low as 2% in 99, then climbed back up. So there's the equity risk premium, the blue line. So that's the price of risk in the equity market. This black line is actually the default spread on one rating class, BAA. This is an investment grade bond. So it's a default spread for an investment grade bond. So that's the price of risk in the bond market. I want you to play the role of a CFO. And you're saying, I can issue equity, I can issue debt. Forget about all the rest of the stuff. This is macro stuff. You're saying, which market should I go to? Now, most of the time, when one goes up, the other goes up. The equity risk premium goes up, the default spread goes up. But there have been periods in time in the US where the two have gone in different directions. Let's take the first example. In the 1990s, see that blue line? That's the equity risk premium. It's coming down all the way through the 90s with the dot-com boom. The black line, I said, was the price in the bond market. It goes up and down, but it doesn't, you don't see the same downward trend. In fact, by the time you get to 1999, the peak of the dot-com boom, what's the equity risk premium? It's about 2%, and the spread on a BAA-rated bond is also 2%. So if you were a CFO of a company in 99, you're saying, should I issue equity? Should I issue debt? The equity market is charging you very little for risk, right? And the bond market is charging you much more. So which is your preferred way of raising financing? If you can raise money cheap on the equity market because the equity market is not charging you much for risk, you're going to go all out in equity. That was, in a sense, the age of equity financing. A lot of technology companies went out there and said, not just technology companies, telecom. I mean, companies essentially went out there and said, we're taking advantage of a market mispricing of one market versus the other. It's a lot of equity financing. Then you get to 2001, of course, you had 9-11, and then the Fed decided to kind of try to keep interest rates and default spreads low. They worked at the bond market, and they succeeded. Because if you look at the default spread, it starts to drop, but the equity risk premium stays high. So if you're in 2004 or 2005, and you're a CFO, you look at these two markets, you know what you see? An equity market where the risk premium has stayed high, and a bond market where it's relatively cheap to go out and borrow money. This is, of course, the golden age of the LBO. Because what have I done? I've made it very cheap for you to go out and borrow money. And you can buy stocks at prices you were able to buy them at five years ago, six years ago. So companies borrowed a lot more money in 2004 through 2007. I mean, that's, in fact, the core of the subprime <coughs> crisis, right? The subprime crisis was not that you lent money. 
to people who are bad credits. It's you didn't charge them a high enough interest rate. It was a default spread crisis. We charge too little as a default spread, collectively as lenders. You're saying, you're not a bank. You buy a bond, you're a lender. Anybody who essentially bought bonds in 2004 through 2007 charged, charged too little. And companies took advantage of that. They borrowed a lot more than they normally would have. So collectively, if you look across time, this is the factor that drives why optimal debt ratios for all companies go up and down. It doesn't explain why there might be variations across companies, but it explains why this optimal might change over time. So those are the four factors, and when you do get to it, put the numbers into your spreadsheet. Okay? And as I said, I promise you, if you have your financials with you, this takes about 15 minutes to do. Put the numbers into your spreadsheet, you will get an optimal. It'll, it'll, it'll do everything I did for Disney on that spreadsheet. It'll give you the actual, the current cost to capital, current debt ratio. It'll give you the optimal debt ratio, the optimal cost to capital. It'll tell you how much your value as a firm will change if you go to the optimal, how much the, exactly what we did for Disney, it'll, it'll kind of do for you. But don't take the numbers as a given. What I'd like you to do after you get the optimal is ask yourself, for my company, why is the optimal what it is? That's really what I'm looking for is can you tell me, a, can you establish a narrative here as to why your company has a 40% optimal or a 10% optimal or a 70% optimal? And that's where you can look across the five or six companies in your group. Because you will get different optimals for these companies. And then you can talk about why one company has a low optimal and the others a high using these four factors that we just laid out. Any questions on the determinants of optimal debt ratios? So we've talked about the cost of capital approach, we've talked about the enhanced cost of capital approach, let's talk about the APV approach, the adjusted present value approach. The adjusted present value approach was developed at the University of Chicago about 30 years ago. And in fact, if you went to the University of Chicago, this would be the only way you'd be taught capital structure. So let me step back and explain what you do in the adjusted present value approach. You separate the financing decision from the business decision. In other words, here's what you start with. You value your firm as if it were an all equity funded firm. So how the heck am I going to do that? I'll give you a couple of ways you can get there. But you're going to start with that. Value the firm as if it had no debt. Then you're going to bring in the effect of debt through its two big effects. One a positive, the other is negative. What's the biggest positive effect of debt? Tax benefits. So you capture the tax benefits of debt. The biggest negative effect is the expected bankruptcy cost. Your value as a firm is the value of the firm without debt, the unlevered firm value, plus the tax benefits of debt minus the expected bankruptcy cost. Then you look to see what mix of debt gives you the highest value as a firm. So at every debt ratio, you compute the tax benefits, the expected bankruptcy cost to come up with the value at each stage. So let's look at these steps. To get the unlevered firm value, there are two ways I can go about doing it. One is I can do a full-fledged discounted cash flow evaluation, where I take the cash flows to the firm. Remember how I computed that for Disney? But then discount those cash flows at what my cost of capital would be if I had no debt, which is what? If I, if I, have, a, if I have no debt, then I have all equity, right? My cost of equity will then be based on an unlevered beta because I have no debt. So I would just use the unlevered beta cost of equity as my cost of capital you can come up with an unlevered firm value. The upside is it's a full-fledged valuation. The downside is it's a full-fledged valuation. It's a lot of work. So here's the other choice. I know the market value of the firm already, right? 61875 for Disney. That market value reflects where the company is right now, how much debt it already has. So if I could just take out the tax benefits of debt that they have right now, and add back the expected bankruptcy costs. You see why I'm going to, in other words, I'm saying, I know what the value of Disney is at 27% debt, but what if I took out all of the effects of debt? I can come up with an unlevered firm value. I'm starting with the market values are given and backing into the number. Both ways I can come up with an unlevered firm value, but getting to an unlevered firm value is usually not a difficult thing to do. Second step are the tax benefits of debt, and that's pretty simple too, right? What's the tax benefit of debt again? It's the interest expense saves you taxes. How much does it save you in taxes? The tax rate times the interest expense. For how long? As long as you have debt. So the present value of tax benefits of debt, especially if you assume they're a perpetuity, 
Just turn it to be the tax rate times however much you borrowed. So you have a hundred million dollars. You multiply that by that by the tax rate, you've got the expected tax benefits of debt. So that's going to be easy. So the unlevered firm value might not be easy, but it's doable. The tax benefits of debt are trivial. Which brings me to the third item, which is the expected bankruptcy cost. And this is a nightmare. It's a nightmare because I need two numbers. I need a probability of bankruptcy, which I can get, but I need a cost of bankruptcy, which includes both direct costs and indirect costs. Now do you see where the nightmare comes in? What's in the indirect cost again? It's things that don't happen because you have too much debt, like people not buying your product, like suppliers not providing you credit. So it's very difficult to observe. So the unlevered firm value is easy, the tax benefit is easy, the expected bankruptcy cost is a bit of a nightmare. So generations that have gone through the University of Chicago and variants or derivations of the University of Chicago have come out of school saying, I use the APV approach. And they do. They get the unlevered firm value, they get the tax benefits, then they get to the expected bankruptcy cost and they start waving their hands. It's too difficult to do. Therefore, I'll ignore it. There's this widely held presumption that if you ignore something, you're not making an assumption. If you ignore something, are you making an assumption about expected bankruptcy costs? You're assuming they're zero, right? And you know what's going to happen? If I take the unlevered firm value, add the good stuff from debt, and ignore the bad stuff, how much should I borrow? As much as I can. Now do you see why this is every LBO guy's favorite device for looking at debt? No matter how much you borrow, I clap and say, congratulations, you did the right thing. Because I counted all the good stuff from debt, I'm not counting the bad stuff. So if you're going to use the APV approach, use it right. Bring in the expected bankruptcy cost, and I'll give you a couple of ways you might get there. First, you need a property bankruptcy. You know how I'm going to do it? How did I get the cost of debt at the different debt ratios? for the cost of capital approach. I use the interest coverage ratio to come up with a synthetic rating, right? Triple B, double B, single B. I'm going to take one extra step. I'm going to take that synthetic rating and back out a probability of default based on that rating. And I'm actually going to use Ed Altman's research on it because every year he updates his table where he looks at companies or bonds from 10 years ago in different ratings class and see what percentage default. The cost of bankruptcy is a tough one. I can give you in qualitative terms why companies should have different bankruptcy costs. I can also tell you that, very, that, that the direct cost is easy. It's about 5 to 10 percent. The indirect cost can vary anywhere from 5 percent for a grocery store to 30 percent for a company like Boy. Remember, the indirect bankruptcy cost is higher for some companies than another. So I'm going to try this on Disney. And I'll tell you my weak spot. This, this, this cost of bankruptcy is going to be a complete and total guess because I really have no good way of coming up with that number. But I'm going to try anyway. So here's what I start out with. I start with the property of bankruptcy. And as I said, I use Ed Altman's table for doing these updates. This is the table from 2010, I think, or 2009, where effectively what he does is he goes back 10 years to 1999. And he looks at all bonds, triple A, double A, single A, then he follows them up for the next 10 years to see what percentage of bonds within each ratings class default. So as an example, if you look at all bonds listed triple A in 99, and you track them for the next 10 years, only 0.07% of those bonds default. No surprise, that's why they're triple A, right? And as you go down the rating, no surprises, the, the default probability tends to increase. So if you're a double B rated bond, over the next 10 years, the probability that you will default is 16.63%. So I'm going to actually compute a synthetic rating at every debt ratio and estimate a probability of default based on that rating. So let me start with Disney's unlevered firm value. I know the value of the firm right now is 61875 It's market value of equity plus estimated market value of debt. The question I'm asking is, what if they paid off all their debt? What would happen to the values of the firm? Well, first thing that will happen if they pay off all their debt is they're going to lose the tax benefits on the existing debt, which is 16682 The tax rate is 38%, so I take away the tax benefits because they no longer have the debt. 
But if they take away the debt, they'll also not have the expected bankruptcy cost. So I add back the expected bankruptcy cost, which is tiny, because given their rating, 0 0.6, uh, the, point, the rating is single A, the probability of default is only 0.66%. 0.66% of my, expect, my bankruptcy cost gives me my expected bankruptcy cost. And here's my guess number. The 25% of 61, you're saying, what's that 25%? That is my guess. I won't even say estimate because that, that glorifies it too much. That is my guess of what the indirect bankruptcy cost and direct bankruptcy cost at a Disney as a company. You know how I pick 25%? The outer end of the range is at 10 to 40. I have nothing. If this were Boeing, I'd have gone with the upper end of the spectrum. If this was safe, I'd have gone with the lower end of the spectrum. This is Disney. I have no, way, no idea where to go, so I go right down the middle. You think that's an estimate? Well, you estimated zero, right? I'll take my estimate over yours. That's basically the way to think about this. Is, is this an estimate? Sure. But everybody makes estimates. Unless you can come up with a more precise way of making estimates, make your best judgment, guess, whatever you want to call it, move on. So I've subtracted out the expected bankruptcy cost. See the 55, 638 million? That is my estimate of what Disney's value as a firm would have been if they'd been all equity funded. So I've taken away the tax benefits, added back the expected bankruptcy cost. Here's the rest of the story. The value of the firm without debt doesn't change. It's 55, 638, no matter what. At every debt ratio, here's what I do. I look at the dollar debt. I compute the tax benefits. It's the tax rate times the dollar debt. I estimate a probability of bankruptcy based on the synthetic rating. So I use that table that I had in the capital structure spreadsheet to come up with the rating, use that estimate. So the expected bankruptcy cost is the probability of bankruptcy times 25% of my value as a firm. So here's the value of the firm. The unlevered firm value plus the tax benefits minus expected bankruptcy cost is my value for Disney with debt built into the system. What's my objective? Maximize the value of the firm, right? You go down the last column, there it is. My firm value is maximized at about 50% debt. It's a little higher than I got with the cost of capital approach. But if I really wanted to make it look like I knew what I was doing, you know what I could have played with? What would have made my optimal lower in this, the APV approach? What's the one number that I said was a complete guess? I said I used 25%, right? If I used 30%, you know what? I'd have got exactly the same answer. So look, both approaches give you the same answer, but I didn't want to lie. Because that would have been just made up. I can make the numbers always give me the same answer. But with the APV approach, the wild card is that, that bankruptcy cost. And that number, if it's high, is going to give you a lower optimal. If it's low, it's going to give you a higher optimal. Yes? Yeah? Okay, that's a good point. So the question is, where did the interest go? So if I multiply 16,682 by the interest rate times the tax rate, I get the tax savings in one year, right? What's the present value of my tax savings in perpetuity then? If I assume that that tax savings is going to be there forever, I'd have to divide that by the cost of debt. So guess what? There's a cost of debt in the numerator and a cost of debt in the denominator. They cancel out. So in a perpetuity, what happens is the interest rate, which is in the numerator, is also in the denominator, cancels out. It's a shortcut. If you have a perpetuity, which is what I'm assuming here, this is the present value of tax savings. If you want to make a more complex assumption about the debt, if you assume, for instance, that you're going to have it only for 20 years, then you can no longer do this. You'd have to compute the tax savings, take the present value of an annuity over 20 years of the savings. But the shortcut works because I'm assuming a perpetuity. Right? Any other questions? So now we have three approaches, right? With the cost of capital approach, we got 40%. With the enhanced cost of capital approach, we got 30%. With the APV approach, we're getting 50%. You know the good news is? All three approaches are giving me optimals that are still higher than the actual debt ratio. I mean, if they'd split, then, then I'm in, you know, then I, if I go to Disney, I, I can't give them a unified recommendation. On the one hand and the other hand. On the one hand, you look under leveled. The other hand, you look over leveled. Here, all three approaches are pushing in the same direction. So now let's talk about the way I think most companies pick the debt ratios. Now, you look at the cost of capital approach and you break it down. It's really not a complicated, it's a painful approach. It's, it's, it's lots of details, but it's not a difficult approach. 
I mean, you give me a person, a smart person from your finance department in any company, in about three hours, I can have them up and running on a cost of capital approach for a company. So if companies say, this is too complicated, to do, I don't buy it. But companies don't seem to pick up debt ratios based upon a cost of capital analysis or an enhanced cost of capital or even an APV analysis. You know how most companies pick debt ratios? They look at everybody around them in their sector. They see what other people are choosing as debt ratios, and they try to stay as close as they can to their peer group. And this is not just capital structure. If you ask me how most companies set dividend policy, you know what they do? They look at all the companies around them. They look at what they pay in dividends and try to stay as close as they can to their peer group. Why do you think that is? Why are companies or CFOs of companies so intent on trying to stay close to the peer group? What is, there must be some benefit you get by staying close to the industry average or some set of benefits. What are the advantages of staying close to the industry average? Sorry, somebody. You don't get fired, but carry that through. You get fired if you make a mistake, right? Are you going to make a mistake with, if you pick the industry average? Sure. But when you make a mistake, guess what? Everybody else made the same mistake. So the old defense comes up, don't pick on me. I just did whatever. It's a six-year-old's response to a question, right? Your six-year-old comes home from school. He's done something incredibly stupid. Say, Karen, why did you do that? See, everybody else was doing it, Dad. And of course, his mom jumps in with a classic mom response to that, that answer, which is, if everybody else jumped off the bridge, would you jump off the bridge too? <laughs> to which, if you're a normal six-year-old, you know what you're going to answer is? If everybody else is jumping off the bridge, Mom, sure, I'm going to do it. You want me to be strange? And companies are run by six-year-olds sometimes. They do it because everybody else is doing it. And if everybody is screwing up, this becomes their, their defense. Oh, no. You know how many bank analysts from 2007 are still bank analysts today? You go back and look at their recommendations in 2007. What did they ask you to buy? Lots of banks, right? And you did. And you lost a ton of money in 2008 by any just standard. They shouldn't have a job anymore. But they're still bank analysts. You know what their defense was? Don't pick on us. Because we were all doing the same thing. There is a defense here which comes from the fact that if you're close to the peer group, then if you make a mistake, you're less likely to be fired. You're less likely to lose your job. You know the other reason they try to stay close to the peer group is? Because equity research analysts are incredibly lazy people sometimes. So when you have a company that borrows far more than the sector, even though it can afford to borrow a lot more, it has bigger cash flows, it's more stable. What do equity research analysts do? They compare this company's debt ratio to the industry average, saying this company has too much debt. Look, it's higher than the industry average. So you can't just blame companies. If investors are lazy about the way they judge companies, that companies are going to follow. You know what? I don't even try to fight this anymore. There's no point going to companies saying, don't worry about the peer group, because they're going to worry about the peer group. You do a cost of capital approach for a company, you come up with an optimal, I'll wager the first question you're going to be asked after you've done the optimal is, if we do that, will we look strange? Will we be an outlier in the sector? So be ready. So here's what I'd suggest. If you're going to, to, to look at the peer group, at least do it in a sensible way. Sensible way in what sense? We know what the variables are that drive optimal debt ratios. If you're an entertainment company comparing yourself to other entertainment companies, ask yourself, where am I different? Do I have higher tax rates? If you're Ryanair, you do not want to be at the industry average for other airlines because your tax rate is lower than everybody else's. If you're the largest saving, if you're Microsoft, you do not want to be at the same debt ratio as other software companies because you're larger, you're more stable. So try to adjust for differences between you and the other companies and say, you know what? I know the industry average is 30%, but I'm riskier than the typical company in the industry, so I'm going to stay at 15%. And broadcast it. Be open about it. Be transparent about it. Try to force those lazy analysts and investors to pay attention to why you are where you are. So I'm going to give you a couple of ways we can do this. Okay. At this stage, if, if, if you review my recommendations based on the cost of capital approach, I told you that Disney was under leveled, right? Its actual debt ratio is 27%. Using all three of my approaches, it looks under leveled. You know what? I've 
I can reinforce my recommendation to Disney by taking Disney's actual debt ratio, and I looked at both book and market, and comparing it to the debt ratios for entertainment companies. So let's say I go and come to Disney and say, look, your optimal is 40%. They say, but if we do this, will we look strange? You know what my response is? You go to 40%, you're actually going to look less strange because you're going to be closer to the industry average. It's nice to get reinforcement or recommendation by saying, hey, not only do I think you're underlevered, but so does the rest of the market. For our Cruz and Tata chemicals, I found them to be over-levered using a cost of capital approach. And guess what? Looking at their actual debt ratios, they're over-levered as well. They're much higher than the typical companies in the sector. I got luckier. My industry averages pushed me in the same direction as my overall assessment. With Tata Chemicals, the, the, the difference is small enough that depending on the ratio you pick, you could come up with slightly different answers. But in this case, at least, the industry averages are my ally rather than my enemy because they reinforce the message I'm sending when I do the cost of capital approach. If it's too little debt for Disney, too much for our Cruz, too much for Tata Chemicals. Now, I said you'd like to control for differences between your company and the rest of the sector, right? But let's say there are 50 companies in your sector. They have different debt ratios, different tax rates, different, different everything. You say, I can't eyeball the data and say what's tip, you know, and control for differences. You're right, you can't eyeball the data, but you can let statistics help you assess differences. So let's say you have 50 companies, and I took the debt ratios of these companies that, look, I want to explain differences in debt ratios across these 50 companies. And I'm going to stick close to my trade-off. And I use the tax rate to capture the tax benefits. I use the variable in earnings to capture how risky your business is. And I look at how much cash flow you have by looking at your EBITDA. And I run this regression across your companies. So this is across your sector, 50 companies. I run this regression. I'll get a regression equation. So I use Minitab, SPSS, whatever, Excel, whatever I need. Once I get a regression equation, I can plug in the numbers for your company into that regression equation, and I can come up with a predicted value for your company. I say, what the heck does that tell me? It says, given how other companies in your sector are setting debt ratios, and given your differences from the other companies, it's like relative valuation plus. Basically, I'm taking what you do in relative valuation, taking it to the next step. Rather than talking abstractions, let me go back to this, right? I looked at other entertainment companies, and a lot of them in the US. Okay, there are about 50, 60, I mean, I actually had a sample, I think, of, 50, of 80 entertainment companies. But they vary. Some are very small, risky companies. Some are very large companies like Disney. In fact, Disney is kind of the outlier in the entertainment business, right? Disney and Time Warner are much bigger, more diversified than any other entertainment company you're going to find in that mix. So I took these 80 entertainment companies. So it's a big Excel spreadsheet. I had the debt ratios for each company, market debt to capital. I took the tax rate and how much these companies had as cash flows. I actually started with four or five variables. A couple of them were not significant, so I took them out of the regression. So this was the regression I got by looking across entertainment companies. So what does it even tell me? Basically, across these 80 companies, it looks like every 1% increase in your tax rate increases your debt ratio by 0.54%. Companies with higher effective tax rates have higher debt ratios. And every 1% increase in your cash flows measured as EBITDA, increases your de debt ratio by about 0.69%. The R squared of this regression is not bad, 40%. Statistics classes, they might not like that R squared, but I'm fine with 40%. So here's what I did. I took Disney's tax rate. 37.2% was their effective tax rate. I took Disney's cash flows. EBITDA is a percent of firm value, 17.35%. I plugged it into the entertainment sector regression and I came up with 0.3710. So what does that tell me? Given how entertainment companies set debt ratios, and given Disney's specific cash flows and tax rate, I would expect Disney's debt ratio to be 37%. One more item in the ammunition, right? They're at 27%. The optimal of the cost of capital approach is 40. Enhanced cost of capital is 30. APV is 50. Now, based on how other companies in the sector they should be at 37%. Okay. Now, the problem, of course, is then Disney might say, we're not comparing ourselves to the sector. We're a big market cap company. We really compare ourselves to the entire market. Can I do what I did with 80 entertainment companies across the entire market? Sure, right? Big, well, what am I doing? I'm running a big regression. I'll have a much bigger sample, a lot more noise. 
So I said, no problem. I'll run it across the entire market. There were about you know, 6,000 companies in my sample. So I ran a regression of debt ratio for these companies against these variables. And I picked these variables based partly on the trade-off. So the reason I picked intangible assets as a percent of total assets is to capture the agency cost problem. Remember we said that bankers are much more unwilling to lend to companies which have a lot of intangible assets. I threw that in there. I threw in the percentage of insider health shares to capture that added discipline issue because if you have a lot of insiders running the company, I shouldn't need debt to make you more disciplined. I threw, threw in the EBITDA as a percent of market value to capture how much you had in cash flows. And I threw in the growth variable to capture the fact that if you're a growth company, you probably will borrow a lot less money because you've got to worry about uncertainty in the future. And there's my regression. I'll give you the bad news first and the good news later. What's the bad news? 13 cents, right? Only 13% of the variation in debt ratios across all companies can be explained by fundamentals. What's the good news? I can still use the regression. It is statistically significant. It's going to have a lot of noise. My prediction is going to come with a lot of noise. But that's truth in advertising. You give the prediction and say, you know, there'll be a big range around this number. But now if Disney asks me, given how the market is setting debt ratios, these 6,000 companies, where do we stand? I can plug in the numbers for Disney, which were 24% for the intangible assets, 7.7% for the closely held shares. You know the bulk of the 7.7% was from? What's the definition of an insider? It's managers, directors, and one of those directors, at least in 2009, held 7% of Disney, right? Steve Jobs, basically the 7.7%, you might as well call it Jobs percent. At that point in time, that's what it was. EBITDA as a percent of firm value was 17.35%, a growth rate of 6.5%. I plugged it in. I came up with a predicted debt ratio of about 29%. So how would I describe it? If I were to characterize this to Disney's managers, how would I characterize the 29%? I can't call it the optimal debt ratio or the right debt ratio. Because all I've done is taken how other companies pick debt ratios and tried to channel it into Disney, right? So here's the way I'd characterize it. Given how other companies in the markets are setting debt ratios, and given your specific characteristics as a company, you should be at about 29% debt. And you know what they're going to say? There. That's why we're at 27%. We did this analysis. We never, never showed it to you. Okay? And you know what? Maybe that's why they're at 27%. Maybe they're trying to stay close to overall market ways of thinking about debt ratios because that's the way they think they measure. But I don't think they're in this regression. Okay? So at this stage in the process, if you ask me all of the numbers for Disney, this is what the numbers look like. The, op the actual debt ratio they have is 27%. The optimal that I get using four different approaches. We never did the operating income approach. We basically just play with the operating income to see what the likelihood is that they will not be able to make interest expenses. But all of the intrinsic approaches give me 30, 40, 50%. The two relative approaches, one against the sector, one against the market. The mo one against the sector gives me 37%. The one against the market. So on every measure, Disney has too little debt. If I use the market number, it's only 2%, but if I use the APV approach, I have a 23% excess debt capacity. So I would feel comfortable after looking at all of these numbers saying, hey, you know what? I think Disney is under level. Would I have been just as comfortable if the approaches had given me different answers? They're out of hedge. I said, you know what? I can give you a range and it looks like, you know, that you're somewhere in the range. But in this case, all of the approaches feed in to the conclusion that Disney has too little debt. Are a cruise and Tata Chemicals? On every measure that I looked at, they look like they had too much debt. So if you look at, uh, if you look at the, uh, the intrinsic approach, the cost of capital, the APV approach, or the industry averages, it looks like they have too much debt. You can never be categorical. Because you can never, you're always, have, but looking at the numbers, at least the sense you get is Disney can afford to borrow more money. Tata Chemicals and Aura Cruz should try to pay down as much debt as they can because they have too much debt. Any questions on the approaches to come up with the optimal? So now let's do the next step in the process. Let's say you come up with the optimal. They're saying, now what? So now I'm one week ahead on, on the project. You've done the capital structure spreadsheet. You got an optimal. It is different from the actual. 
Where do I go next? So what I'd like to now talk about is, first, if your actual is different from the optimal, <coughs> what's the next step? Answer might seem obvious, just borrow the money, get to your optimal, but that's not always the right solution. The second part of, that I want to address is, if you decide to go to your optimal, and you ask me what kind of debt should I take, long term or short term, fixed rate or floating rate, euro or dollar, I want to be able to give you an answer. So let's start with the first part of that question. You've got your actual, you got the optimal. When you compare those two numbers, one of three things is going to be true. Your company could be like Disney, it could have too little debt. Your company could be like Aro Cruz, could have too much debt. What's the third possibility? Your company has the right amount of debt. In which case, what should you do? Obey the Hippocratic oath. Do no harm. Too many people, when they're asked to come into companies and give advice, feel the urge to give advice. Sometimes the best thing to say is, you're doing the right thing, let's move on. There'll be other dimensions where you might disagree with the company. So if your company's actual is 28% and your optimal is 30%, leave it alone. On this dimension, at least, it's doing the right thing. But let's take the two interesting dimensions. There's too little debt or too much debt then you have to make some decisions. First, you have to decide how, how, how much of a problem it is and how quickly you have to fix it. Second, you also have to decide what the right kind of financing is to get there. So let me set up a table that I use to kind of make that decision. And this is kind of a general framework you can use anytime you have a company that has an actual difference from the option. If you're going to have a problem, would you rather have too little debt or too much debt? Come on, think about it as a, as a person. I mean, would you, as, as an individual, would you rather have too little debt? Of course, it's a no-brainer. You'd rather have too little debt, right? So let's take the pleasanter problem first, and then we'll deal with the unpleasanter problem later. So let's suppose your firm has too little debt. The first follow-up question you need to ask yourself is how much of a danger is this to me as a company? You're saying, what's the problem with having too little debt? It might potentially make you the target for a hostile takeover. Why would having too little debt as a company make you the potential target for a hostile takeover? What do acquirers like about companies with too little debt? Yeah. The potential to load you up with debt. First is the potential to load you up with debt. Who's you? No, no, the, the acquirer. So the acquirer can borrow money to buy your company and claim that difference in value that we computed by going to the optimal, right? I'll give you the analogy. And this analogy won't go all the way through but hang in there anyway with me. Let's suppose you buy a house in the New York area. It's going to cost you a million dollars still, housing prices. And unless you're a drug dealer, you've got to borrow money to buy this house. So let's say you borrow 800000 you buy the house. But you're very frugal. You save every cent, every dollar, every hundred, every thousand dollars. And in five years, you pay off the entire loan. Your mortgage is now gone. You decide to have a mortgage party. The old days in the US when people actually used to live in their houses all the way through, when you paid off your last mortgage, you'd have a mortgage burning party. And here's what you do, you invite your neighbors and you'd physically burn the mortgage papers. Once in a while you'd burn the house down with it, but that's kind of ironic or tragic or whatever way you want to see it. So let's say you decide to have a safe mortgage burning party. Why is it safe? You have fire extinguishers on the walls. You, you, know, you invite the local fire people to the... So they're all there. And you also made the mistake of inviting your neighbor, Bob, who's never liked you. He doesn't like the shrubs you picked. He doesn't like the way you cut. He basically just doesn't like you. But he shows up anyway. It's free food. And while he's sitting there eating your coffee cake and drinking your orange juice, he plots his revenge. So right after the party, he goes to the friendly neighborhood bank. And he says, you know what, that house in my neighborhood, it's an all equity, the only all equity financed house, it's worth a million dollars. I'd like to borrow $800,000 against that house. I told you this analogy would not go all the way through. You know why, right? You walk into a bank and you try to borrow money in your neighbor's house. What's the bank going to say? I don't know what they would given how banks behave. I have no idea what they would say. But if it's a sensible bank, it's going to say, it's not your house. You can't go around borrowing money out of other people's houses. But let's say this is your friendly neighborhood banker. 
He says, no problem, Bob. Here's your $800,000. So he's now borrowed $800,000 on your house. He proceeds to do a hostile acquisition of your house. I don't even know what form this would take. He approaches your kids and says, you want the entire basement for yourself? No problem. Just sell me your 51% share. So he buys 51% and he throws you out. Thank God this can't happen with the house, right? But let's change the facts a little bit. Let's suppose you're a CEO of a publicly traded company with a billion dollars in value, which potentially could borrow $600 million. But you don't borrow any money. You know why? Because as a, you don't like debt as a CEO. So you've chosen not to borrow. I see your company. It's a billion dollar company. that can have $600 million debt, has no debt. So I go to the friendly neighborhood bank and I try the same ploy I tried with the house. I say, hey, there's a billion dollar company out there. It's not my company, but you lend me $600 million against that company. The bank is probably going to say the same thing about the company that it said about the house, right? It's not your company. And until 1981, 82, that would have been the end of your search, right? What happened in the early 80s? Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham, what did they, what did they create? What are junk bonds? I, uh, humor me, I'm, I'm completely, I mean, they call them high yield bonds, junk bonds, but what are junk bonds? Basically bonds with a rating below triple B, right? Have there always been junk bonds? Sure, as long as there's been a bond market, there's been a junk bond market, so Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham did not invent the junk bond market, but you know how bonds became junk bonds pre-81? is they were issued as investment grade bonds and they slid. You know what Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham created? It was an original issue junk bond market. Because pre-81, if you were not investment grade, you could not issue bonds. There was no original issue market. They said, no, you can't do it. Mike Milken and Drexel Burnham said, sure you can if you pay a high enough interest rate. He said, how does that help me? I'm the acquirer, right? I want to buy your company, billion dollar company. I want to borrow $600 million. The bank's refusing to lend me money. So I'm going to go to Drexel. He said, look, I'd like to borrow money against a company that I don't own. Drexel says, that's very risky. You'd have to pay a 15% interest rate. I said, no problem. I'll pay the 15% interest rate and borrow the $600 million. And I take out a full page ad saying, and what helps you here is history. What kind of history? That you've done this before. Say, so I'm Boone Pickens. I've done five of these before where I've taken over companies with... Which, I don't, which don't belong with borrowed money, I'm going to try it on, you, on this company. And because I have the history, you as bond buyers buy the bonds I issue. The reason you do it is not because you feel charitable, but because you get that 15% interest rate. I borrow the money, and I buy the company. And here's the unexpected or the expected bonus I might get. You're a very conservative CEO, right? In addition to not borrowing money, what have you very conveniently accumulated in the company for me? A lot of cash. So you've accumulated $250 million in cash in the company. So you know what I do right after I take over the company? I take that $250 million in cash and I pay down some of the debt. It can't get any sweeter than this. I borrowed money using your assets. I use your cash to pay off the debt I borrowed using your assets. You've made my life incredibly simple. So if you're a company with too little debt, that's the question I ask. Are you the potential target of a hostile takeover? You say, how the heck am I going to answer that question? Let's look at some of the factors that might drive this. Let's suppose you do an optimal debt ratio for Microsoft. Right now, I think you get about a 30 to 40% optimal. Even with all the debt they've taken, they're at about 6%. So they're under level. You think it's a potential target of a hostile takeover? What are, the, what are two big impediments you might run into trying to do a hostile takeover of Microsoft? One is size, right? You've got to come up with 250 billion. That's a lot of money. What's the other? To do a hostile takeover, you've got to buy 51% of the company, right? And if you look at the, the top investors in Microsoft, the Steve Ballmers, the Paul Allens, the, the Bill, Bill Gates, they collectively still own 20, 21%. It's far more difficult to get to 51% of a company of insiders. So the first two things I'm going to look at are the size of your company and what percentage insiders hold. So if you're a small to mid-sized company and insiders don't own much stock, there are two strikes in my favor. And the third thing I'm going to look at. Every hostile acquisition is actually a fight between two sides. 
On the one side is the acquirer. And what's he saying? Sell your shares to me. On the other side are the incumbent managers of the company. And they say, don't sell them. Your shares to that. And you're the stockholder. For once in your life as stockholders, people are paying attention to you. So the managers are saying, don't sell your stock. The acquirer is saying, sell your stock. And you get to decide who you're going to listen to. Let me tilt the scales a little bit. Let's suppose your stock price has dropped 80% over the last five years. Who are you going to listen to? What are the managers saying? Trust us, we know what we're doing, right? And you look at your stock price and say, well, if you knew what you were doing, why is my stock down 80%? So the third factor I'm going to look at to decide whether this is going to work is I'm going to look at how well or badly your stock has performed over the recent past after adjusting for risk and after adjusting for market performance. Does that sound even remotely familiar? Did we come up with something that measures how a stock is done after? That was the Jensen Alpha, right? Jensen's have a big negative number. You're the stock that actually underperformed the market. That did terribly. So this is your trifecta if you're a company. You're a small to mid-sized company. You don't have much in insider holdings. You have a negative Jensen's alpha, and you have too little debt. You're an accident waiting to happen. You're the company that has to do something quickly. You've got to bring your debt ratio up quickly. Say, so how the heck do I do that? How do I go from 0% debt to 40%? It's easy to do. You can always borrow money and buy back stock, right? You can do it in two weeks. If you're a small enough company, you can even do what's called a debt for equity swap, where you go to equity investors in your company and offer them equivalent bonds in your company, equivalent in terms of market value. Overnight, you can go from zero to 40%, but you do it because you feel that pressure. It's called a recap, right? So what I talked about last session. In the late 80s and the early 90s, there were lots of recaps. I think there was one study that looked at 101 recaps in those five-year period. 97 of them were triggered by the threat of a hostile takeover. Managers don't do this because they feel the urge to do it. They feel it. They feel the pressure from below. So if you have too little debt and you fit these characteristics for being the potential target of a hostile takeover, then you've got to do something quickly. But let's suppose that you're not the threat of, under threat of a takeover. Why? Because you're too large, like Microsoft. You have insider holdings, or you're a company that has done very well in the past. Or you're like Cracker Barrel. Did you read that article yesterday? They spit on their fries yesterday. They adopted a poison pill. Exactly that flip over rights plan we talked about. Huh? Where the rights are useless if Cracker Barrel managers continue to run the company. But if any stockholder gets to a 20% threshold, the rights become this explosively valuable rights. For any of those reasons, good or bad, if you decide your company is not the, under threat of a hostile takeover, then you have time as, on your side, right? You can take your time adjusting your debt ratio, and that's good to do. So I'm going to ask you a follow-up question if you have time. Do you have good projects? It's kind of a stupid question to ask, right? Because if you ask managers, do you have good projects, what's the answer you get from every company's management? Of course, we have great projects. That's why I don't trust what you say. I'm going to look at what you've done. I'm going to look at collectively whether your projects have earned a return greater than what they should have earned. Whether the return in capital collectively on these projects exceeds the cost of capital. Again, haven't we looked at something that captures that? We computed the EVA, the return on capital for Disney versus the cost of capital. We came up with that 2.5% spread or 2.4% spread. I'm going to look at that because if that number is a negative number, you can tell me till you're blue in the face that you have great projects. I'm going to say, I don't trust you. So it's a problem. If it has good projects, my advice is you have debt capacity and you have good projects. You have a marriage made in heaven. You get a double whammy. You get a double whammy because by borrowing money and going to your optimally, increase your values of firm. Then you take good projects. What's the definition of a good project in the net present value world? A project that has a positive net present value, right? And remember what we said, when you take a positive net present value project as a company, your value as a company increases by that net present value. So if you have great projects and you have debt capacity, of course you should borrow money and take great projects. But if you don't have excess debt capacity, 
then you have to figure out other ways to bring a debt ratio up, including stock buybacks, <coughs> dividends, whatever you need to do, borrow more money, but do it gradually over time and see if you can bring your debt ratio up. So if you're under levered, that's the pathway you follow. Are you under immediate threat of a hostile takeover? If the answer is yes, fix it quickly. If not, you have good projects. If you have good projects, borrow money to take the projects. If you don't, figure out a way to increase your debt ratio gradually over time. Now let's take the more unpleasant problem. What if you have too much debt? Here again, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. How much time do you have? And there's going to be a morbid ring to the question here. Because if you have too much debt, you know what I'm worried about? Not that you're going to get taken over, but that you might go under. That you might. So the question I'm asking is, are you under bankruptcy threat? So let me again ask a practical question. Let's suppose you have the unpleasant problem for your company that has too much debt. And you're saying, is my company under bankruptcy threat? What are some of the things you're going to look at to make that judgment? Don't wait for the news story to show up in the Wall Street Journal saying company under bankruptcy threat. You're going to look at the interest coverage ratio. You're going to look at the ratings. I'll tell you something. If this is a real company and it's your client, you'll know when it's under bankruptcy threat. You know how you'll know? You'll fly in to visit the company. The airport's 20 miles away from the company. They'll ask you to walk. And by the way, bring your own toilet paper. Nothing here. You walk into the company. It's like a funeral home. If you've ever been in companies on their last legs, it's easy to tell. And if you're under bankruptcy threat, for whatever reason, you're worried about making the next interest payment, then you've got to do something quickly. You don't have the luxury of devising five-year plans. So let's see some of the ways in which you can try to bring your debt. So you see the problem here? You have too much debt. You want to bring it down. So what are some of the things you could try to, you could do to bring your debt ratio down? I mean, there are a fair number of companies where this is going to be the problem. It might, in fact, be your company. So what are some of the, the actions a company can take to bring its debt ratio down? One is it can try to sell assets, right? To pay down the debt. Nothing comes easy when you're over level. What might be some of the, some of the problems you run into if you try to sell assets to pay down the debt? Everybody knows you're desperate, Right? So you sit across the bargaining table with this asset worth a hundred million. This, the buyer says, I think it's worth a million. So you missed a couple of zeros. No, no, I think it's worth a million. Desperation means that you take big discounts on value. So you say, that's not going to work, so I can't sell my assets. You can issue, try to issue new stock, right? Raise new equity. What's the problem with that? You're going to a market where everybody knows you're a basket case, and what are you trying to do? You're trying to issue shares. That's going to be tough to do it. I'm not saying it's impossible, but tough to do. So you know what most companies that have too much debt try to do? They try to go to the lenders and say, you know what? I owe you a 30-year loan, a three-year loan, right? Let's make it a 30-year loan. And then 8% interest rate, could we make it a 0.8% interest rate? And they say, why would a lender ever agree to these terms? You know, this is ironic, but your bargaining power as a borrower is maximized just before you go bankrupt. Because what do you threaten to do? If you don't agree to my terms, I'm going to throw myself at the mercy of the court. And we all know how efficient the legal system is in taking care of you as a So you take full advantage of your bargaining power to extract the best terms. And borrowers through history have always done this, right? In fact, Latin America is some of the most interesting payback mechanisms ever known. If you go back 100 years, Latin America has had more sovereign defaults than any other continent. I mean, by, by magnitude of 10 times more. And it was, I think, the 1800s, 1880, 1890, a lot of European banks had led to, I, I don't know which, I don't want to insult the particular, but I, I'll, it's, it's Ecuador, but it's one of those you know, smaller, and they had trouble making their bank payments. So they offered to pay in guano which is bird droppings. They said, we don't have cash. Would you take some bird droppings instead? The bank initially said, no, we usually don't get paid in bird droppings. And the country said, would you like bird droppings or would you like nothing? And the bank said, you know what? Bird droppings are awfully good. They're very good fertilizer, basically. Go sell them somewhere else. You can extract some incredible terms when you're under duress. And there are some people who are masters at this game. One guy, actually, who's a very high profile. He lives in New York. He has his own TV show. You know who I'm talking about? The Donald. 
The guy likes to call himself a great business person. The guy is a serial defaulter. You know how many times he's defaulted? In fact, every time he borrows money, he seems to default. Atlantic, the, 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 he's probably going to sue me after I said this. But no, it's, 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 the truth is right there in the court documents. But there's Trump Casino in Atlantic City. He went to the bank and said, you know what, I can't pay you. I'll give you 20 cents on the dollar. The bank said, please, please give us 30 cents. And they thought they were getting a big favor, 30 cents on the dollar we got. My problem is not with what Trump does, which is he's extracting the best. My question is, why do people keep lending money to this guy? He builds these big, garish, gold-covered buildings, and he never pays you back? If I were a bank, if Donald Trump walked in, I'd be running out of the back door. Lock all the doors. Don't lend this guy money. But if they keep lending him money, of course he's going to take them to the cleaners. So if you don't have time, do something quickly. But if you do have time, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you when you had too little debt. Do you have great projects? Because if you, this is the most painless way to get out of being over leveraged. Because if you can take great projects with equity, with retained earnings. You know what happens? Over time, you grow as a company. You might know exactly what you did five years ago. But now as a bigger company, your problem has essentially gone away. But for that to happen, you need great projects. If you don't have great projects, then it becomes a little more painful. My advice to you is, if you're paying a dividend, stop. You have too much debt. What? Why are you paying a dividend? And when I tell this to CFOs, you know what the response is? We don't want to send a bad signal. What universe are you on? Everybody knows you're in you know, diabolical trouble. You continue to pay a dividend. The message I get is you're in denial. Not that you're dealing with this in a healthy way. So if you're over leverage, stop paying dividends, take every last dollar, pay down the debt, and try to make your debt problem go away. Because you don't want hanging over your head. So let's try this for Disney. So that's my company, so I'll take it through the process. You're going to be doing the same thing for your company when you, got, when you get your optimal. So first, actual versus optimal, it does look like they're under leverage, right? So I have the cost of capital approach, so I can use all five approaches to say they're under leverage. Is the firm a potential target for a takeover? Hostile takeover. 2009, let's go through it. It was about a $61 billion company. It's not Microsoft, but it's not small either. So let's view that size as a strike against being all. It's, it's pretty large. It's not huge. Insider Holdings? It's got Steve Jobs. But Steve Jobs is not exactly a Disney insider, so if he felt that Disney was being run badly, I, I don't think he'd have any, any qualms about joining the opposition. So let's view that as a kind of semi-strike in, in, in favor of a takeover. What was the Jensen Salva? Does anybody remember was, whether it was positive or negative? We looked at it like five weeks ago, so I, I don't blame you for not remembering. I think it was a positive five point something percent a year. So at least over the five, last five years, it's, since Iger became CEO, they've done pretty well. That's what tilted me in favor of saying this company is not going to be the target of a hostile takeover. I told you last session that this is the third edition of the books. I've tracked Disney, 97, 2003, 2009. <coughs> and as I've tracked the company, I've gone back and forth on this question. In 97, when I first looked at Disney, Disney had a value of about $69 billion, which at that time was a really big company. It had a nice positive Jensen's Alpha. And I said, the company's not, the threat, not under threat of a hostile takeover. In fact, right after I finished the first edition of my applied corporate finance book, I bought 1,000 shares of Disney because I wanted to feel the pain. And God, did I feel a lot of pain over the next three years? Because between 97 and 2000, the company's stock price had. You know how difficult that was to do between 97 and 2000? Everybody else is quadrupling. They were having. How do you pull that off? It was almost like the company was run with a perverse objective of minimizing firm value. AT&T and Disney were in a race. You can get to zero first. I'll get to zero first. You get to zero first. And they looked like they were going to get there. So by the time I got to 99 or 2000, I was incredibly frustrated as a stockholder. So my vision of a good day would have been to open up the Wall Street Journal, see a headline. E-Toys announces hostile acquisition of Disney. Just to see the look on the faces of Disney's men. You need somebody to shake them up saying, guys, you're in trouble. It's not working. 
In fact, you could see 2000, 2001, there was talk already starting about potential takeovers. In fact, Comcast made one of the most insulting takeover offers of all time on Disney. And I talked about this earlier, which is they, they, they but you could see that Disney's managers were starting to get worried about, about takeovers. You know how you could tell? Michael Eisner started talking about how much he cared about stockholders. Michael Eisner. Getting on CNB. In fact, first thing he started giving interviews on how much he cared about stockholders, stockholder wealth maximization, which I found is a deadly giveaway that CEOs are afraid that they're going to get taken over. Okay? And I'll give you the, 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 the story that brings it home best. Until the late 90s, large European companies thought they were immune. By Europe, I mean every, everybody but the UK. European companies thought they were immune from hostile takeovers. They thought of that as the barbarians in the Anglo-Saxon world did that stuff, but Europe, they were more civilized, didn't do hostile takeovers. And they, they were so okay with that, they were fine, it was great for managers, until you had Telecom Italia in late, the late 90s. Telecom Italia was the first large hostile acquisition in Europe. Olivetti borrowed money and did a hostile acquisition of Telecom Italia. And it shook up European CEOs to the core. So about six months after the Telecom Italia acquisition, I was actually in Milan or one of those conferences and I was uh, given the job of being master of ceremonies, a job I hate because you can never say anything that's on your, you know, it's supposed to kind of, so and so is going to talk brilliantly even though the person might not be brilliant. So my job is to actually hang out at the table and kind of say, you know, introduce each of them. And one of the people that I was sitting next to was the CEO of Siemens. So he gets up and he says, at Siemens we care deeply about stockholder wealth maximization. And I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> I mean, this is a company that's treated stockholders like mosquitoes through its entire, say take a dividend, go away. He's talking about stockholder wealth maximization. In fact, the sensation I had when I heard him talk about stockholder wealth maximization was the same one I had when I heard Madonna sing like a virgin. <laughs> to which your first reaction is, how the heck would you know? I mean, what is this? A deeply repressed memory? What are you, you know? <laughs> CEOs like Michael Eisner talking about stockholder wealth maximization are talking about things that they don't even remember. They have no idea. What, but I guess deathbed conversions are better than no conversions at all. So when you hear that talk about CEOs, don't be surprised to see the cracker barrel CEO out in the news the next couple of weeks talking about how much he cares about stockholder wealth maximization. Okay. It's a sign that they're scared. And that's a good thing. So take your company through this process. But to do this, you've got to do the optimal capital structure first. Okay? Because that really is what I would like you to do, is come up with the optimal debt ratio for your company and take it through this framework. Do they need to do something quickly? Look at the potential for a takeover or for bankruptcy. And then follow it up by asking, do they have good projects? And uh, we'll start off with the right kind of debt for your company in the next session.